grazie a Circolo dei Vettori, questa è la terz'ultimo incontro di questi dieci giorni di curiosità infinita, siamo molto contenti, sta andando tutto molto bene e quindi grazie per chi segue tutto, vedo delle facce che ritornano. Stasera abbiamo Lawrence Weschler, è stato per vent'anni staff writer a New York e ha scritto numerosissimi libri che parlano di tanti argomenti diversi, ma come ama dire lui, tragedie, tragedie politiche e commedie culturali, nel senso che ha scritto di Arthur, ha scritto di David Hockney, ha scritto di Robert Irwin, ha scritto di Hans Spiegelman, ed è adesso direttore di una magnifica istituzione che si chiama Institute for the Humanities, fondato da Richard Sennett a NYU, a New York, e devo dire che un pochino, se vogliamo, lo spirito di questi dieci giorni di curiosità infinita è, deve qualcosa allo spirito dell'Institute for the Humanities e credo che se non ci fosse, e io come, sia come autore che come curatore di questa cosa devo molto a Renzi, un vero maestro in tutti i sensi, sia come persona che, come, che soprattutto come intellettuale e come scrittore. Come ha detto una volta Rick Moody, che, ho anche avuto, che sarà qui per la Milanesiana la prossima settimana e che ho anche avuto l'onore di, di, di presentare proprio qua in questa sala qualche anno fa, Ryan Weschler is a god. So, lui parlerà per, eh, per un'oretta facendo una, le, una lezione su arte e scienza. I'm going to be speaking today about art and science as parallel and divergent ways of knowing it. And perhaps the best place to begin is with a remark by that great, great artist and scientist, Vladimir Nabokov. As you know, he was a great novelist, but he was also an exceptional butterfly specialist. He was very well regarded as a scientist. And once, uh, talking about the requirements for a great novelist, he said, You have to have the precision of a poet. You have to have the precision of a scientist and the passion of a, the precision of a poet and the passion of a scientist. What's funny about that, of course, is usually you think of it the other way around, that a scientist is precise and a poet is passionate, but Nabokov understood the truth there. Speaking of poets, I often like to begin Uh, these sorts of talks with poetry, and I have two poems at the start of this one. We left out, you should have pieces of paper so you may be able to follow them. Um, the first is by Thomas Lynch, who is a great undertaker poet. He, his day job is that he, he runs a funeral parlor. Uh, but he was the poet laureate of America a few years ago. And he has a poem about Euclid, about the great, great geometrician of Alexandrian times. And I'll read part of that. What sort of mourning was Euclid having when he first considered parallel lines? Or that business about how things equal to the same thing are equal to each other? Who's to know what the day has in it? He then goes on to describe a few of his friends and how they go about their days, and how one of them was once a truck driver. And might he, and I'm going back into the poem, might he, clearing customs at Niagara Falls, have arrived at some insight on holes and parts, or an axiom involving radii and the making of circles? how distance from a center point can be both increased endlessly and endlessly split, a mystery whereby the local and the global share the same vexations of geometry. Possibly this is where God comes into it, who breathed the common notion of coincidence into the brain of that Alexandrian over breakfast 23 centuries back, who glimpsed for a moment that morning, the sense that it all made life, killing time, the elements, the dots and lines and angles of connection, an egg's shell opened with a spoon, the sun's connivance with the moon's decline. 
Sophia the maid served with pouring juice. Everything, everything coinciding, the arc of memory, her fine parabolas, the bend of a bow, the curve of the earth, the turn and the road. And that's by the way, combination Euclid. I like to think of that line, Sophia the maid serving servant pouring juice. Uh, that she must have looked very much like this. Um, she, Sophia, of course, is Greek for wisdom. And so there's that. And she's pointing out rather than, than, uh, than uh, juice. But I think that that is a wonderful personification of wisdom right there. Which in turn brings me to the second poem by Vyslava Zimborska, the great Polish Nobel laureate who just died a few months ago. She has a poem called Maybe All This, which means all of this, everything. Maybe all this is happening in some lab, under one lamp by day and billions by night. Maybe we're just experimental generations, poured from one mile to the next, shaken in test tubes, not scrutinized by eyes alone, each of us separately plucked up by tweezers in the end. Or maybe it's more like this. There's no interference. The changes occur on their own according to a plan. The graph's needle slowly etches its predictable zigzags. Maybe thus far we haven't been of much interest. The control monitors aren't usually plugged in only for wars, preferably large ones, for the odd ascent above our clump of Earth, for major migrations from point A to point B. Maybe it's just the opposite. They have a taste for trivia up there. Look on the big screen! A little girl uh, uh, is sewing a button on her sleeve. The radar shrieks, the staff comes at a run. What a darling little being with its tiny heart beating inside it. How sweet its solemn threading of the needle. Someone cries, enraptured. Quick, get the boss. Tell him he's got to see this for himself. For sure the image that Jim Borska must have had in mind the image of that little girl spread up there across the big screen must have been very much like Vermeer's lace maker. In my dreams she had written elsewhere, I paint like Vermeer of Delft. And one of the most remarkable things about this painting in turn is the way that everything in it is slightly out of focus. That's even true when it's not a slide when you're in front of a painting. Everything is either too close or too far. Except for one thing, the very thing that she is focusing on. In the painting, those two little threads, that V, are completely in focus. The thing that she is concentrating on is the concentration in the painting. Um, she is concentrating uh, like nothing else so much as a painter or in this context, we might say a scientist, lavishing his or her entire attention on his subject. Or else perhaps what happens is we ourselves pause, dumbstruck, before this canvas in the midst of our museum walk, in this case at the Louvre. Or even perhaps exaggerating here, let's get more closely. Um, Uh, for starters, look at the threads themselves, how they arrange themselves into a tight, crisp V, which in turn is couched in the M of her hands. So it's V, M, from here. The girl, godlike, momentarily focuses all her attention upon VM, the very author of her existence, and hence back to the poem, for the girl threading the needle, the little darling bean with its tiny heart inside, is of course nobody else but the poet. 
laboring over the perfected line on the page. Or else, subsequently, perhaps us, her readers, hunched over her completed poem. Though as the creator of the poem, Zimborska is at the same time the boss. As we too, the readers, get momentarily to be recreating, recapitulating her epiphanic insight, seeing it clearly for ourselves. Indeed, Zimborska gets it just right. How in the perfected work of art, be it a poem or a painting, or I would argue an experiment and its conclusion, across that endlessly extended split second of concentrated attention, the audience, the artist and the audience alike partake of a doubled sort of awareness. The expansive vantage, lucidly equipoised of God, the concentrated experience, meltingly empathic of his most humble subject. So I want to begin by talking about absorption, about concentration. The moment, as Leo Steinberg says somewhere, when the artist stops asking, what can I do, and starts asking, what can art do? I imagine it's similar with scientists. What is the world doing? Not what am I seeing, what is the world doing? Or as Diderot said, uh, painting is best when the artist steps back slap-jawed before his creation. Diderot, who, I also, who also said that the artist is merely the first observer of the completed work, which is to say, that moment when he stops being the creator and suddenly becomes a slap-jawed witness. For, of course, the whole distinction between art and science is a very recent one, historically speaking. It really only begins in the middle of the 17th century, in the 1650s. And it lasts, perhaps, well, I would argue it doesn't even last to our time. It was an aberration in history to think of art and sciences separately. It's a very recent distinction. At my Institute of the Humanities at NYU, Central to the Institute are the scientists. We don't make the distinction. Um, and as, as I say, it's a very recent thing. Before 1650, everybody used to have wonder cabinets in which works of art and works of nature were all thrown together. Um, in this instance, you know, people have uh, insects, a uh, beetle down here, they have paintings, or a bigger shelf. The idea was that these were all examples of creation, of God's creativity, including things that human beings could do. The marvel that they could do it was, a, was a, 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 a reflection of the marvel of God. So you, and, and you look for things that were marvelous and wonderful, you look for skulls with horns on them. Uh, all kinds of crazy things would be found in these cabinets. And uh, every, all the great uh, aristocrats would want to have one. One could likewise, of course, cite examples of Leonardo and Michelangelo who would not have understood what you're talking about when you talk about the difference between science and art. For them, it was all part of the same passion, especially anatomy, uh, which far from being a scientific discourse, was the discourse of observation that was the province of artists. And that in turn brings us to arguably the greatest, uh, I have to warn my friend Francesca who hates seeing blood, I stop looking right now, um, but the great, the great, great painting in the tradition of, of anatomy lessons, which is Rembrandt's anatomy lesson. I want to spend a few minutes talking about this painting because I'm going to argue that this painting, this day, this moment is the day that art and science split up for a long period. Um, the year is 1632. The year is 1632, and this is the anatomy lesson of Professor Nicholas Troop, the most eminent anatomist in Amsterdam at the time. Rembrandt is 26 years old, uh, and has more or less just arrived in town. By the way, 
We're not talking about this Rembrandt, we're talking about this Rembrandt. He's 26, he's just arrived in town, and with this painting, he's effectively putting out his shingle as a portrait painter. In compositional terms, Rembrandt is portraying the professor, a corpse, as you can see. We even know the name of this person. Uh, he is a thief. He was parenthetically arrested and hung for having stolen an overcoat, very much like the overcoat of the professor. Um, the professor is using a book over here, which is Vesalius, the great anatomist. The professor has six students, you can see. Three of them form an inner triangle here. And then there's these three out here. We can ignore this guy over here. Um, he, sh he surely paid his dues late, demanding to be put in the painting. And, and Rembrandt said it's too late, and he gave the money and said, okay, I'm putting you in. But as you can see, Rembrandt portrays him as an idiot <laughs> for being late. The painting really is about this group here. Um, and, and what I want to talk about is, I want to start by talking about where people are looking in this painting. Um, what's happening is that, uh, you'll see that it's, for starters, the, the corpse is laid out as part of the tradition, even with that loincloth. As the, and with the feet, you can't really see them here, but the feet are basically facing out. And they're reminiscent of other great images of Christ, deposition of Christ, in this case, Montaigne. Um, it's also interesting and unusual that in this painting, the anatomy lesson is beginning with the arm. That would not ordinarily have happened. Every other anatomy lesson we have begins as every anatomy lesson actually began, which is Ordinarily, they would start with the belly because that would be the part that would, would uh, decay the fastest and they needed to empty that out. Um, but the, in the case of having the hand, um, there's all kinds of interesting things going on. For one thing, the one other picture of an anatomist who starts with a hand is the frontispiece of that book that we were looking at a second ago by Vesalius. Um, that is Vesalius there, and the great artist, Jan van Kalker, who was a student of Titian's almost 100 years earlier, uh, he has his uh, frontispiece portrayed with the hand. So at some level, we could say that maybe the uh, Tok had himself asked to be shown with the hand to be the true heir of Vesalius or that Rembrandt is comparing himself to Van Kalker. It's also worth noting, by the way, that the, although this scene happened, it happened on a particular day, January in 1632, uh, this wasn't a photograph. This was a painting that took months to paint, and people came in for separate sittings, and so Rembrandt would have been, had decided which way he wanted different people looking and so forth. And all of this would have significance. This is not just a random snapshot. It, it's, it's true of all the paintings you go to a museum to see. We like that we have the fallacy of the photograph that the, the artist just sat down and made a painting of what was there. That's never the case. It's a construction. It's very much thought out. And in this case, I want to talk about, I want to ask, well, actually, everybody close your eyes for one second. Close your eyes. And see what you remember. Um, there's that middle group that I was pointing to, those three guys in the middle, who are looking absolutely astonished at something. What are they looking at? I know that the way I remembered it when I do that is that they're looking at the dissected arm. But now open your eyes. They're not looking at the arm at all. What they're looking at, with complete astonishment, is the professor's hand. And the professor is saying, with these muscles here, you can do this. In effect, the professor is talking about the two greatest wonders that make up a human being. On the one hand, the hand, I mean, just like this hand, 
look at what, isn't this unbelievable what this thing can do? Uh, and also vision, that you can see it. Which is to say, the professor is mar uh, that Rembrandt is calling attention to the marvels that make painting itself possible. Um, hand and eye. Um, another way of putting this is this is not at all a painting about death. This is a painting about life and the lively. One of the things about science is that when a scientist understands something, he will say, oh, I see. Oh, I get it. Uh, the veils fall from his eyes. A scientist describes how he is vouched fresh perspective. What scientists are striving after is what artists are doing all the time. David Bohm, the physicist, says that physics is a form of insight and hence a form of knowledge. Einstein always claimed that the imagination was more important than knowledge. Leonard Schlein has written an entire book about art and physics on which he charts how time and again the artists were out in front of the scientists. For example, Giotto was working on conic sections and ellipses long before Kepler. Or the way that Manet and Monet and Cezanne were playing with compressions of time and space, the plasticity of time and space, decades, decades before Einstein. Having said that, I want to bring out a specific aspect of this painting. Because we've talked about those three guys, the question is now, what about these three? What are they looking at? Oh, just before, I want to show you one thing before we leave those three guys. If you go to the museum, the Moritzkas, in, 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 uh, in Amsterdam, and you're actually standing in front of a painting, this guy here is actually looking in two different places. One eye, this eye here is looking there, and this eye here is looking there. It's like a movie. It's going up and down. But now I want to turn to the other guys and ask you about the three guys on the outside. What are they looking at? Um, again, um, um, these things are taking place, for one thing, obviously, they are looking at the painter who's painting them in the fiction of what's going on. In other words, they are looking at the man, Rembrandt, who is, who is doing the stuff that all this is making possible. So you could almost say that they're looking out at the painter. This, I just made this up, don't pay attention. It's not too serious. Um, but more importantly, it's important to realize that these sorts of events in Holland took place in theaters. They were public events. It would be very much like what's going on here today. There were people in the audience. And W.G. Sebald, the great German-English uh, writer, has, in his book, The Rings of Saturn, makes a very strong case that one of the people in the audience that day, in 1632 in Amsterdam, especially since in Amsterdam, these things happen quite rarely. There was only one or two of them a year. Whereas in Leiden, where Rembrandt had come to, they had come from, they were quite regular. But the chances are that in 1632, a newly arrived exile in Amsterdam, who was completely intoxicated with anatomy, would have been at this thing, and that's Descartes. René Descartes was most likely in the audience. And that's significant, because Descartes is the person, more than anyone else, who is about to bring about the split between art and science. He, five years later, will write the Discourse on Method, the Meditations, in which he's going to start talking about the human body as if it were a robot, as if it were a mechanical instrument. He's also going to be the person who starts talking about the X and Y axes. He is going to invent, invent Cartesian geometry. 
it's often interesting to think about you know the x axes and the y axes whether that comes about in the west because of christianity or and this is a secularization of christianity in some sense but in any case he is going to start inventing the sorts of things like x and y axes which in a few years are going to lead to the calculus to Newton and Leibniz with their analysis of things. And you're, it, once you get there, you begin to have this period where art and science begin to fall away. That art is going to do things quantitatively. Everything will be subject to the quantitative formula of the calculus. Art will go off in a completely different direction, and that will continue for some time. Um, the discovery of the calculus, by the way, puts me in mind of, of, early, of someone who, in a sense, anticipated the calculus. This is Nicholas of Cusa. Um, Nicholas of Cusa was a church father in the 1400s. Um, he was a diplomat. He was uh, a scientist. He was all sorts of things. Um, he was the Archbishop of Cologne, but he was more than anything else a number mystic. And in one of his major works, a book called Learned Ignorance, which is a wonderful title, Learned Ignorance, he talks about knowledge um, in the context of a debate that he is having with Aquinas, basically. Aquinas effectively says that if you want to get to God in good Aristotelian fashion, you document everything in the world. You do a book about plants, you do a book about animals, you do a book about stars, you do a book about ethics, you do a book about politics, you do everything and you document everything, all of creation, you are on your way to getting to God. And Cusa effectively says that can't be right. He says, imagine a circle with a regular polygon inside of it, let's say a regular triangle. And now you add a side as a square, you add a side as a pentagon, a hexagon. It's almost like a circle. But then he says, actually, it's not at all, it's not at all like a circle. Because a circle, your thing has a million sides, a circle has one side. Your thing has a million angles, your circle has no angles. And he says that at some point, you have to make the leap. He coins the phrase, the leap of faith, from the cord to the arc. Uh, a leap that can only be accomplished, he says, in grace. You're working outside numbers, outside quantity, into quality now. Um, and by the way, that is where Kierkegaard gets the phrase, the leap of faith. He gets it from Cusa. In any case, uh, what, what's, what I always find fascinating about that metaphor, it applies to so many things. Uh, I think those of you who are writers in this group will have experienced when you're trying to write and you get blocked. You have all the material, but it just won't pop into shape. It doesn't get a voice yet. And you work, and you work, and you work, and finally, it just happens. Uh, it pops into the circle. I'm sure that's true of scientists as well. You work, and you work, and you work at something, but that happens all by itself. And it would not have happened without all that prior work, but the prior work doesn't cause it. There's all that or something else which is for free. And, and you know you hit it when you tap it and it rings true. It sounds right. Anyway, I say all this as a prelude to talking about two artists in particular who I've spent a lot of time with and their attitude towards science. One of them is Robert Irwin, who is not that well known here in Italy anyway. Um, He's a major, major figure in, in American art and California art. The reason you don't know about him, perhaps, is that for many, many years, he would not allow his work to be photographed. 
He said that a photograph captures nothing that the work is about and everything that it is not about. A photograph captures the image of the work and not the presence of the work. And he's very interested in the immediate presence of things. Um, and then the other is David Hockney, who perhaps is better known to you. Um, and what's interesting is that both of them are highly self-taught. Uh, no particular university education. And during their careers, they become more, and, and they are completely opposites of each other. They can't stand each other. <laughs> Actually, it's very funny. I've been writing about them for, for 30 years. And uh, I began by writing a book about Irwin. And then I got a phone call from Hockney saying he disagreed with everything in the book, but he couldn't stop thinking about it. And I should come to talk to him. And so then I wrote a piece about him which was a refutation of the Irwin. Uh, and Irwin called me and said, not true. And she said, bullshit. Uh, and then I wrote another piece about Irwin. And this has been going on for 35 years. They've never spoken to each other, but they always talk to me about each other. <laughs> anyway, but what's interesting is how they both come to see science in, their, in terms of their work. Let's start with Irwin. Um, in the old days, um, he would have thought that there was no, that artists and science do something completely different. But at a certain point in his career, he began working with an engineer and a life scientist in NASA, and national, uh, the space program, named Edwards. And he increasingly began to see the similarity between what scientists do and what artists do. Take a chemist, for example, he said to me one day. He starts out with a hypothesis about what might be created if he combined a few chemicals. And he begins by simply doing trial and error. Two thirds of this, one third of that. And he marks down the result. He tries one third of this and one thir third of that, plus one third of something else. And, he and, then, and then he tries one quarter and three quarters, and then he tries various variations until he gets the resulting wants. It's a process of trial and error. What the artist does, he says, is essentially the same. In other words, what you do when you start to do a painting is that you begin with a basic idea, a hypothesis of what you're start set, setting out to do. Let's say a figurative painting, or a non-figurative, or whatever. Say you're going to paint a, a painting about this model over there, and the trees outside, behind her, and the oranges on the table. It's just a million yes, no decisions. You try something in the painting, you look at it, you say no. You uh, sort of erase it, you move it around a little bit here, put in a new line, you go through a million different ways. It's the same thing, the only difference is the character of the product. Let's say at a particular point the scientist gets what he's been set out to get. He arrives at what he projected would happen and you mix those those particular combinations together. But the same thing is true of the artist when he finally gets the right combination. He stops. He knows he's finished. Uh, and you may find that when you say, well, why did you stop there? He said, because I knew it was finished. And you might find that difficult to understand. One of the differences is the scientist can show you all his notes. How, you know, he did this and this and this and eventually arrived at that. Whereas the painter, for example, paints over his notes. So you don't have that record to look at. But in fact, it's quite, now this is him talking, uh, in fact, it seems, if for you it might seem that he just chanced upon the final version. But in fact, it's quite reasonable what he did. Given the basic fundamentals, he's tried to select every damn combination possible, every way possible, until he's finally arrived at what makes sense to him. The critical difference is that the artist measures, uh, the, the, excuse me, the critical difference um, is, uh, is that the artist measures from his intuition, his feeling. In other words, he uses himself as a measure, whereas the scientist measures out of an external logic uh, and makes his fact decisions finally on whether it fits the process in terms of various external abstract measures. Another way of putting this is that the artist reasons 
while the scientist uses logic. You can't logic, you use logic. Uh, whereas you, you yourself reason. And, and Erwin makes a distinction between reason and logic. Um, reasoning is this him again. Reasoning appears to be more confused, more haphazard, partly because of the scale of what it's trying to deal with. The logical, in a sense, seems more successful because it cuts the scale down. In fact, that's what makes it logical. It takes a very concise cut of the world. Here we're back with Descartes again, and, and the calculus eventually. It takes a very precise cut of the world uh, and simply defines or refines by deduction the properties of that cut. But it never deals with the overall complexities of the situation. It only applies within the confines in which it operates, so it seems much clearer. In this context, I'm reminded of a great comment by the information theorist and computer scientist, Jaron Lanier. I don't know if he's known here, but a uh, wonderful character. Um, who says, information systems need to have information in order to run. But information underrepresents reality. What makes something fully real is that it's impossible to fully represent it to completion. In other words, whenever you talk about something in terms of its information, you're not talking about its real, its reality, because reality can't be reduced to information. Eudora Welty, the great story writer, says, making reality real is art's responsibility. And parenthetically, not sciences. Uh, Kant says somewhere that a work of art is a specific instance of a general law that cannot be stated. The artist, however, and now I'm back with Erwin, as a reasoning being, attempts to deal with the overall complexity of which all the logical substances are merely segments. He deals with them through the intuitive side of his human potential, and here, inconsistency are as meaningful as consistencies. And he goes on to note the way that the civilization we've been living in for the last 400 years is one that bases most of its primary decisions on logic. But the civilization which you and I live in makes it up. But over the last 150 years, which is a legacy that I'm having to deal with as an artist, art began to drop out of that. It began to become less logical. Even though it proceeded logically, it found questions that could not be answered logically. And now I want to turn to Hockney for a few moments. What's interesting about both of these artists is that they both claim that the most important thing that's happened in the last 150 years is Cubism. And Cubism not simply understood as an art movement, but as an entire politics, a way of seeing the world, a way that refuses to look at, as Hockney says, for example, talking about photography. Photography is all right if you don't mind looking at the world from the point of view of a paralyzed cyclops for a split second. But that's not what the world is like. And cubism is all about trying to come up with a representation of all the different possible perspectives and vantage points simultaneously. Um, Erwin believes that if you take cubism seriously, you would be doing what he's doing, which is more and more and more abstract. Hoffman believes that, in fact, cubism saved the possibility of figuration while taking in all the multiple perspectives, and they, that's part of their argument. But anyway, um, coming back to Hockney, uh, one day I was talking to him, and he was saying that he was at a friend's house in Canada. Um, he went and picked up the book and showed it to me. And basically he was talking about, about quantum physics and specifically about the uncertainty principle. Um, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, of course, is highly technical and specialized, he told me. It deals with a paradox in particle physics, showing how if you attempt to measure the velocity of a given particle, you won't be able to identify the exact location of that particle and vice versa. 
Previous to this, of course, scientists believed that given enough technical advancements, they would eventually be able to measure everything or anything. That they'd be able to measure both the size of the particle and where it was at the same time. But Heisenberg showed that this was not just a problem of not yet having enough technical capacity, but the problem was inherent in the nature of physical reality. The old conception of scientific inquiry had gone on as if we could measure the world as if we weren't in it, as if we weren't in it. Heisenberg showed the observer, in effect, affects what he, that which he is observing, so that some of those old borders and boundaries begin to blur, just as they do with cubism. He, he loves the book by David Bohm, B-O-H-M, called Wholeness and Implicate Order, uh, in which Bohm says, the notion that the one who thinks the ego is in principle completely separate from the, and independent from the reality he thinks about can no longer be sustained. You can see why I'm so excited, Hockney tells me, this insistence on the need to break down borders. Physicists are always talking about overall worldview, the need for new horizons. There's that famous phrase of Gombrich's, the great art, art theorist, about the triumph of Renaissance perspective. We have conquered reality, Gombrich says. A phrase that has always seemed to me such a pure victory, such an empty victory, as if reality were somehow separate from us and the world now hopelessly dull because everything was now known and accounted for. These physicists, by contrast, were suggesting a much more dynamic situation. And I realized how deeply what they were saying had to do with how we depict the world, not, the, not what we depict, but the way we depict it, which is, of course, the province of art. Which brings us back to Irwin. Um, for all of his distinction between the difference between art and science, Irwin believes that, quote, at the periphery of any body of knowledge, whether we're speaking about chemistry, physics, mathematics, psychology, or art, there are laborers who are working beyond the sovereignty of the techniques of their discipline. They are all principally guided by reason, as opposed to logic, simply because past a certain point, the tether of their logic no longer extends. Or more accurately, perhaps, they are the ones who are extending it. These researchers, in Irwin's view, have more to do with each other than they do with the technicians in their own fields. He's dubbed their colleagueship the dialogue of eminence. One day he said, I really feel that there is a, this, this kind of dialogue of eminence, that certain questions become demanding and potentially answerable at a certain point in time, and that everyone involved on a particular level of asking questions whether he's a physicist or a philosopher or an artist, is essentially involved in the same questions. They are universal in that sense. And although we may use different methods to come at them, even different thought forms in terms of how we deal with them, and we will eventually use different methodology in terms of how we innovate with them, still, really, these questions are happening at the same moment in time so that when we find these so-called accidental interrelationships between art and science, I don't think they're accidental at all. Another word he uses in this context is inquiry. All these researchers are engaged in their own way in the process of inquiry. And the most salient feature of inquiry is its open-endedness. It is pursued for no reason whatsoever. It is the project of the passionately curious. The wilderness is stalked by explorers without maps, without any particular goals, and their principal compass is their reason. So now, coming to the end, or coming around the corner here, the public has a distorted view of science because children are taught in school falsely that science is a collection of firmly established truths. In fact, science is not a collection of truths. It is a continuing exploration of mysteries. Coming from the other direction, from the other side, James Baldwin, the great American novelist, wrote, the purpose of art 
is to lay bare the questions that have been occluded by the answers. The purpose of art is to lay bare the questions that have been hidden by the answers. In closing, I'd like to evoke a few last thoughts from two other people. One of them is one of my favorite colleagues at the New Yorker, Ian Fraser. I don't know how much of Ian Fraser is translated into Italian, but whatever it is, you should read it. He's a great, great writer. Um, and he, one of the things that's great about him is he can make essays out of anything. And he was keeping a file of human encounters with bears, with wild bears, just newspaper articles. And one day he took out the file and he wrote an article about this. And I'll just read you the ending. It's possible to walk for a long time through the woods and not see much of anything. Beautiful scenery makes its point quickly. Then you have to pay attention or it starts to slide by like a looped background in a Saturday morning cartoon. A pine cone falls from one limb to another. A rock clatters down a canyon. And your own thoughts talk on inside your head. People sometimes say that what is great about bears, and especially grizzly bears, is the large tracts of wilderness that they imply. That a good bear population implies a healthy, unspoiled habitat. But bears don't simply imply wilderness. Bears are wilderness. Bears are what all the trees and rocks and meadows and mountains and drainages must add up to. When you see a bear, the spot where you see it becomes instantly different from every other place you've seen. Bears make you pay attention. A, book, a, a woods with a bear in it is real to a man walking through it in a way that a woods with no bear in it is not. Roscoe Black, this is the name of the man he's talking about, Roscoe Black, I love this name. A man who survived a grizzly attack in Glacier Park several years ago described the moment when the bear had him on the ground. He laid on me for a few seconds, not doing anything. I could feel his heart beating against my heart. The idea of that heart beating someplace just the other side of ours is what makes people read about bears and tell stories about bears and argue about bears and theorize about bears and dream about bears. Bears are one of the places in the world where the big mysteries run close to the surface. Which I think is a wonderful description of both art and science. Probing places in the world where the big mysteries run close to the surface. Finally, I just want to add, I won't read the whole poem. You have the whole poem of the great, great Thomas Tranströmer, um, uh, who just won the Nobel Prize in Sweden. Um, he has a poem called Century Duty, uh, which is about the rather crazy fact that in Sweden there is compulsory draft so that all men, when he was growing up, all men had to serve in the army for a year, which seemed kind of silly since there's nothing really to, to I guess you defend the, the border with Finland or something. Um, and he has a poem about being on night duty and just how ridiculously silly it is, but also how he's trying to stay centered, trying to stay focused. And at a certain point he says, task, to be where I am. Even in this solemn and absurd role, I am still the place where creation does some work on itself. Dawn comes, the sparse tree trunks take on color now, the frostbitten forest flowers form a silent search party after something that has disappeared in the dark. But to be where I am and to wait. I'm full of anxiety. 
obstinate, confused. Things not yet happened are already here. I feel that they're just out there, a murmuring mass outside the barrier. They can only slip in one by one. They want to slip in. Why? They do one by one. I am the turnstile. <coughs> to be the turnstile and to wait, to be the place where creation gets to do a little work on itself, one can hardly do better by way of characterization of the scientist's lot and the artist's. Only attend. 